Well, we're really enjoying our visit with Ron Halverson, and I know you are too. We've looked at his early life, how he received the Lord Jesus Christ, his early ministry, and uh, now we begin to really examine uh, his ministry as an adult, you might say. Mm -hmm. and you know, one of the things that, that pops out at me, Jim, young people can be such a force to witness to, to, to other young people. Yes. You know, you and I have an age group that we sort of impress or that we skew to, but when a young person talks about Christ to another young person, as Londis did mm. to, to young Ron, uh, it, it carries a, a certain burden, a certain um, uh, power when a young person witnesses to somebody his own age about Jesus Christ. There's, there's something else, though. The Lord can use our extremities. Mm. He can use the situation where Ron was running from the law. Yes. He was afraid that he was going to be, uh, was going to be arrested. Yeah. yeah. And he's got to get away. And he thinks, where in the world can I go? And then he remembers this school where Londis is going. Yes. And he thinks, well, they'd never think to look for me there. Yeah. You know? I'm never in school. <laughs> right. And uh, so the Lord takes even these tough times we get into and he'll use them mm -hmm. uh, to bring us to him. Mm -hmm. and, and this time the Lord got, he was in a bind. Ron knew he wasn't going to get away. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, then he remembers his friend Jim Londis. When you look at the, the, you know, the coincidences or the power of the Lord, it, I can say, New York is very borough conscious yeah. for, for uh, a little lady to leave her home in Brighton Beach or Coney Island and travel all the way into what we call the city, yes. Manhattan, right. to Carnegie Hall, that's a major trip. That's like going from New York to California because, it, you know, back in the days, people in Brooklyn stayed in Brooklyn. People in Manhattan stayed in Manhattan. People in Queens stayed in Queens. Unless you worked in the other borough, you didn't just travel from borough to borough. And so it was really a call of Christ for her to leave her home there and travel to Carnegie Hall and then for Ron to make that trip. That, that's a major thing and that's the call of God on his life. And from very on, you can see the Lord working in his life. So that was where the miracle really began. Yeah. Was with Jim's grandmother, mm -hmm. Jim Londis' grandmother. Yeah, yeah. Making that trip to Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall. Listening to the truth. Yeah. Responding to the truth. You know, if someday we'll be able to look back on things like this and see how the angels were leading her. Ah, yes how that all of this God was working out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, all of this so that he could reach down to this, these two young men, mm -hmm. Londis as well as Halverson, yeah. and bring them to him and the impact they would have yeah. uh, on the world. And you see how he, he mentioned that uh, a large number of his baptisms uh, are male. Now, I, I didn't have that privilege. I, you know, baptized a fair number of people, but I was mostly female. And I think a, that a, attraction is because Ron is kind of a meat and potatoes guy, if I can oh, yeah. use that expression. You know, he's a bedrock, down earth, hard preaching. He knows the streets. He knows what it is to be tough. He knows what it is to have life kick you around. He's a man's man. Precisely. Uh, and and that, that appeals to a guy who's been in the street, who is looking for a strong father figure, who's looking for someone who, who has surrendered himself to the Lord, but is still a, a guy's guy kind of thing, and, and Ron is all of that, and his preaching kind of respects that. You know, Fortis Dedimore, who I quote so often oh, yes. that uh, uh, some people just wonder if he's not my patron saint, but <laughs> uh, Dedimore used to say, you preach to men, and you win the men, and there'll be ladies that follow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ron preaches to men. He yes. appeals to men, and therefore he gets children, women, families, the whole bit. Yeah. Because if you can get the head of the household, the man, more than likely the family is going to be there yeah. as well. And he's gotten more than his share of tough guys. Yeah. Guys who thought they were tough, who carried knives, who carried guns, who did all kinds of things, who saw the power of the Lord change his life and wanted that in, in their own life. Well, in, the, in this second half, he's going to tell the story of one young man that came in San Bernardino mm -hmm. and uh, the consequences of this young man accepting Christ. Oh, yes. yes. And uh, sometimes when we receive the Lord, we do pay great con consequences for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ron is, uh, no baby told us his age, I, I don't think you'd mind we, we, if we told it, he, he is uh, past what we'd call retirement age, but he is in no way retired. He's still, as you like to say, he's still keeping, keeping on, keeping on, That's <laughs> as right. it were, for Jesus. He is, yeah. and uh, still preaching, still sharing God's Word. So let's return to our visit with Ron Halverson. Well, we're back and we're visiting with Pastor Ron Halverson. We've been listening to some tremendous things. We've talked about his birth and 
and how he accepted Jesus Christ and how Jim Londis played such a big part in that. And um, then uh, his early ministry in New England, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of his ministry, but right now we were talking when we went to break about someone in San Bernardino. Yeah, we were holding a meeting in San Bernardino, and, and the night I told the story of my conversion, I called from gangs to God. Uh, we had two gangs there, and it went, one on this side, one on the other side. And at the end of the meeting, I said, if you'd like to speak to me, come forward. And I, I came down off the uh, platform, and a gangbanger fella, Spanish fella, came forward. He had all the gang tattoos, you know, and, and uh, he, uh, he came, he says, this is what I want for my life. Mm. He said, 14 of my 28 years I've been in, incarcerated. 14 of 28 years in jail. And he says, I want out. He says, I, 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 and so there I led him to Christ. I shared with him the good news. It don't take 27 weeks, 27 no. Bible studies. It <laughs> takes five seconds with God. We don't understand the power of God. That His life was changed. Believe me. All the other things came, but his life was changed. That moment on, from that night on, he was there sitting up front, listening to the Word of God, moved by the Spirit, planning for his baptism. We in that meeting, we had a baptism at the Loma Linda swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool. We had 180 that one Sabbath afternoon, 50 in the morning, and then we went on to baptize 363. But here's this kid, kid, 27 years old, his whole life devastated by gangs, tattooed, you know, his whole life is written on him. And he's getting ready for his baptism. He's standing on the porch. I've been down there. I visited him the night before. Standing on the porch, the gang was upset with the fact that he had left the gang. And uh, they drove by his, his live-in, who were going to marry them on Friday night and baptize them on Sabbath. Mm. We have a lot of that nowadays because of the culture. They live together now. But uh, <clears throat> so we usually have a wedding on Friday night, then they baptize them on Sabbath. We're getting, this whole plan worked out. Drive by, blows him away. Oh. He dies. I hear the news on Friday night just before I get up to preach. 3,000 people out there. The, the, the members in the area didn't think anybody would come. We, we, 2,500 every night, 2,000, yeah. 3,000 every night. God was moving in San Bernardino, the orange. No one goes there. It's no. a bad neighborhood and all this stuff. God, God can bring them wherever you think he can't bring Man. them. Anyway, God brought them. So I had to take an offering to bury him. And there was a sweet woman minister uh, there in the Hill Church, yeah. uh, uh, Hybeth, Hybeth, wonderful Christian girl. So she went and found a burial plot in one of the nicest cemeteries. I wanted to bury the kid in a Christian cemetery so that when he came up in the resurrection with his tattoos and all, people would see what a sinner looks like saved by grace. Yes. <laughs> and that was the beginning. I mean, uh, that's out of that experience, the whole the whole meeting, everybody was touched. We gave $9,000 that night to, mm -hmm. to bury the kid and to help his, mm -hmm. his widow uh, to go on with their little baby. And, and, uh, mm. But um, the power of God, it's so amazing. I mean, I've been doing this now for, since a bookie joint in Brooklyn, yeah. but it's so amazing yeah. when I stand up in an auditorium and I hear these pastors, oh, we're postmodern, or no one will come out, and, and all this stuff, and I see people coming and being yeah. touched by the Spirit of God and coming forward in altar calls. Just, I mean, it doesn't change. The human heart is the same. Yeah. yeah. There's a longing in you. In fact, today it is easier in the sense that they want to hear stories of success. What greater success is the gospel? <laughs> That's mm -hmm. right. What greater success is though Jesus, when he came to blind people, he touched them and he saw the light of day. What's greater than that? Well, yeah. when, you, when you left New England, you went down to the south. You went to uh, Georgia. Yeah, I was, a, I was a boy from South Brooklyn. That's right. In, in the south. In Cleveland, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. And then you were in Carolina for a year as an evangelist. Evangelist, yes. And then Elder Neil Wilson called you for what task? They needed someone to do evangelism in New York. They wanted to try to tackle the city, borough by borough, neighborhood by neighborhood. You mm -hmm. can't attack New York no. <laughs> like it's, you know, one big meeting. I mean, it, it, there's too many parts to it. Every neighborhood is a, is yeah. a city in itself. Mm -hmm. right. Every neighborhood is a country in itself. You have the Puerto Ricans. You have the, you have the, uh, uh, the 
people from Central America. You have the uh, the Jamaicans, and you have the Haitians, and you have the uh, you have the Irish, and you, everything. So you, we we got the idea. We go into these neighborhoods, into the storefronts, into the places, and preach and 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 do what we can. <clears throat> so uh, they said they needed someone who knew the city. I knew the city. Hey, I could close my eyes and just tell by the stops where we were. So they, he called me, and I said, well, I'm just here. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. My family, I got boy and girl, the kids, they're enjoying it here in Carroll. He says, well, we really need you. So even though, though I was only there a year, I said, all right. And so I went up to New York, and um, we started holding meetings around, around the various places in the city. And they're not big budgeted meetings, little, you know, it's amazing how that by the time it gets down to us, the salespeople, <laughs> they have no money. They have no money. Isn't that amazing? That program, <clears throat> Elder, was a, was a sort of comprehensive thing because I think at that time they tried to do some things with um, health food restaurants. and You know, Metro Evangelism was a sort of multi-pronged <clears throat> thing. In fact, the first couple I baptized when I was there in the city, uh, Rick and Gwen Shorter, oh, sure. they, they started some of the health, uh, health restaurant in the village. Mm -hmm. um, they tried that. We had the New York Center, which was an evangelistic center oh, in New yes. York, and it was a wonderful place. It was just off Broadway on 46th, 46th Street, Street sure. off Broadway, and uh, we would bring the young men in from for the whole summer from the various seminaries and and the, ver the various schools, colleges, and so I'd have 20, 24 young men, women, and uh, and we would go to, to the different neighborhoods and hold a meeting, yeah. and they would be trained during during the time. Elder Falkenberg, uh, his uncles. He, Elder Falkenberg was president of General Congress, but his uncles, I believe, it was Elman. Elman. El Elman. And, yeah. yeah, and and his other, his brother. Uh -huh. uh, they did a lot of uh, the health work and, and evangelism there before I got there. They left. Elder uh, Thurman, a wonderful man of God, who, who was once a, a co college president, in Southern. He went there to coordinate the evangelism, and uh, and I went to. Uh, to New York City. Yeah. It was good coming home. Now that's why I first ran into him, Jim. Um, right. Someone said, we got to go hear this Brooklyn dude. There's this dude. He's from Brooklyn. He sounds like really, really Brooklyn, but he can really preach. So we, I heard you first at the New York Center back in, I would say, 74, yeah. maybe early 75. That's the first time I heard you oh, speak. It was, yeah. it, was, yeah. it was amazing. Yeah. I remember a funny thing happened. There, you meet so many crazy people in New York. <laughs> so we're out in a vestibule before my meeting, and walks this woman dressed totally in white. And she walks up to my wife, who's at giving Bibles out, and she says, I'm the mother of God. My <laughs> wife don't know what to say, hands her a Bible. She goes in. Then this guy comes in. He looks like Santa Claus, believe me. He says, I'm St. Nicholas. And then finally a guy comes running in. He says, runs up to my wife says, can I marry you? My wife says, well, I'm married to the evangelist. She says, oh, oh. She ran over to my singing evangelist's wife and asked her. He had to get married so he could live in this country. <laughs> So that's the kind of, the, the types of people. But um, my singing evangelist dad passed away and he has to go. And I, I did a dumb thing, believe me. I called our college and I said, send some music. I'm at the New York Center. I'm going to be opening night. I need some music. They send me a celloist. A celloist for an evangelistic series of meetings. City. Opening night. This guy walks out with... Uh, uh, tuxedo, sits down on his chair, starts playing a cello. We have New Yorkers, man, they're all over the place and here in this, he goes on and on and on and on. Finally, I can't take it any longer. Well, I'm losing people out the door. I walk out, I said, thank you very much. I was very good. Ushered him off. Never did that again. <laughs> but we, we, we started that meeting. It was wonderful. We, every night, packed the place out. I would, in fact, I was, uh, we had so many people. We had the, uh, we had Arabs there. We had Jews there. I was talking yeah. in the Arab Israel. What conflict. year was that? What year was that meeting? That was uh, 19. Oh, you should never ask me a, a, a date. 1974. 1974. That was the meeting when I, I I went to that meeting. I attended. Uh, we had, yeah. yeah, and yeah. so twice a year. A lot of pastors came to that meeting. Yeah, yeah. twice a year yeah. we would hold we would hold an evangelistic series at the center, and mm -hmm. then the other times. Yeah. And I held nine series a year, not mm -hmm. these four no. or five like nowadays. Yeah. Nine series a year. We had no per diems. We had nothing. We, we slept in the bottom of churches on mattresses, my two kids, my wife, in, in South Bronx and wherever. That was the way it was. I mean, you know. But I preached nine series of meetings a year, five weeks, five weekends, four weeks, five weekends. And uh, 
it was exciting because New York, New Yorkers are so exciting. You know, the one thing about New Yorkers, you know if they're an interest or not. Mm -hmm. They'll say, hey, I'm not interested. I went down south. That's when I went down to Georgia, uh, Tennessee. Yeah. And I knock on the door and the people, oh, yeah, y'all doing? Y'all come in for, I thought everybody was an, uh, an interest, a prospect instead of a suspect. Yes. They were prospects. So everybody was, but not New Yorkers, you yeah. know, they slam the door in your face. I'm not interested, you know. But when they get interested, the one thing they knew, they were sinners. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest obstacle to get across to anybody, the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that we need a savior. And so I started holding these meetings in, in various places in, in New York City. And uh, my family was right there with me, my boy and my girl, my, my wife. And my wife worked at Faith for Today, but she'd be there every night. Mm. And, uh, and we held forth, and it was exciting. We baptized hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every year mm. in that city. Yeah. I, I remember some of the names of some of the people that uh, I've heard about from there. Goldie. Tell us a little bit about Goldie. I was, I was in Harlem, and it was during the time of black power and white power, you know, the struggle that was going on. And uh, the brethren asked me to go there in January. January to Harlem. Can you imagine <laughs> bringing me to the church in a church in Harlem in January? But you know, hey, I'm happy. I'm serving God. They're all my brothers and sisters. God changed my life. There's no such thing as black or white, yeah. yellow. Or, you're all one. I you're, need to say this. That was what was known about you in New York. They said, this guy does not care. Black, white, yeah. he, he oh, does no, not care. We were, and that kind of went out about you. It was uh, it, the thing that thrilled me that, they, that my black brother would even want me to come. Yeah. So I go up there. We go in this church, nice church. People were faithful. You talk about faithful. January, mm -hmm. coming on the subways and yeah. buses. Do you recall what church that was? That was uh, uh, Metropolitan. Uh, what is that? That's uh, 50. 150th Street? Uh, yeah, 150th Street. That would be City Tabernacle. City Tabernacle. City Tabernacle. Yeah, City the Conference Tabernacle. Church at the time. Conference yeah. was right next door. And they told me. Yeah, yeah. The, the pastor was so afraid in that neighborhood, he wouldn't visit with me. Yeah. He said I would go Roman. I went Roman. Let me tell you, I carried my Bible. They shot me. They had to go through Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I mean, I, I was moved fast. You know, I can't hit a moving target. But I went there, and I met the most wonderful people I ever met. The first night, opening night, I'm preaching. The church is full. God's people. Church is full. And sinners are there. Mm. And I'm happy, as you know, any evangelist is happy of full That's crowd. That's right. And I look out in the crowd, and sitting in the second row, is a woman with a gold afro. You know, that was the day they had the afros. Oh, sure. And this was a giant gold afro. I, I taught homiletics. You're not supposed to look at a person. They get nervous. So I'm trying not to look at this gold afro. But everywhere I turn, there's the gold afro. And I'm focusing on this gold <laughs> afro. And, and she's, after the meeting, she's coming out. She shakes my hand. She says, hi, I'm Goldie. I, yeah, I said, that's a good name. And I'm, I'm really excited. She goes by, and, a, and the deacon looks at me and says, you know who she was, uh, who she is? I said, uh, yeah, that's Goldie. She said, no, that's the prostitute from 145th Street in Amsterdam Avenue. I don't oh. know how the deacon knew that. <laughs> but anyway, he, he wanted me to know that. So I said, wow. And so me being who I am, I did a holy dance, and I couldn't sleep that night. I said, Lord, bring her back. Yes. Don't matter if you don't bring anybody else. Bring her back. And sure enough, next night, Goldie shows up. And the next night, and the next night. And my heart six I mean, pounding in my body. And that's all I can see. Mm. One night she's going out, and I shake her hand. I said, Goldie, I've got to come and see you. And her head dropped. And she said, well, Pastor, she says, let me come to the church office. I said, no, Jesus never said, come to the church office. Yeah. She says, but, you know, I work where I live, and I live where I work. She didn't want to come right out and say I'm a prostitute. And I said, Goldie, that doesn't matter. I come to see, I come to talk to you about Jesus. And I, I need to come see you. She said, all right. I said, will Thursday afternoon be all right? Two o'clock. She said, fine. So on the way home, I said to my wife, I turned to my wife, it's cute. I said, honey, I'm going to the House of Prostitution on Amsterdam <laughs> Avenue, 145th Street on, on Thursday. Would you like to come? She says, yeah, I'd like to come. So we drive up. And if you've been in Harlem, you know you can't find a parking space. You double park, triple park, you oh, park yeah. wherever you park. So my wife double, triple parks there. I get out. I go up the stairs. Customers in the hall and chairs waiting. And I'm white, only white man in Harlem. I'm walking by and say, hey, man, where you going? 
I said, I'm going to see Goldie with my best Christian, Christian smile. I have my Bible in my hand. I said, uh, they said, so are we. I said, yeah, for the wrong reason. I'm a preacher. And they got nervous, man. Yeah. You know, they're all in there. Oh, all right, preacher. All right, preacher. And I knocked on the door, and Goldie says, who is it? And I said, Ron Halverson. She says, oh, Pastor Halverson. She says, we just wait. And I waited. A customer came out. I'll never forget it. Happened 40, 40 36, 38 years. I'll never forget it. Mm. I walked in. What do you say? You talk about the 2,300 days? Talk about lifestyle? Yeah. You talk, what do you talk about? 20, I mean, when you talk about the judge, you tell her that Jesus loves her. There's exactly. a God in the universe who yeah. loves her. Mm -hmm. So I, I sit down on the edge of the bed, and I said, I said, Goldie, I said, Jesus loves you. I wanted to come here and personally tell you Jesus loves you. And she started to cry, and I was crying too, you know. And she says, she says, preach it is something I learned in Sunday school. By the way, I met prostitutes from Sunday school and Sabbath school. All have sinned. Mm. Not sin alike, but alike we sin. And I said to her, I said, she, I, she said, I learned something in Sunday school. I said, what is it? She says, Jesus loves me, this I know, a song. Mm. I said, that's it, Goldie. I've been preaching for 40 some years now, 50 years now. More than 50 years now, since I'm 17. And I, will, I come to one conclusion now in my old age. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible. That's it. That's it. It's powerful. And I said to her, I said, Goldie, Jesus loves you. He loved you so much he died for you. Don't you want to love him? And she said this. I'll never forget it. Tears streaming down her face. She says, I don't know how to love. Mm. I don't know how to love. I said, just talk to him. Pray, pray to him. She said, I don't know how to pray. I said, talk to him like you're talking to me. Mm. Tell him what's in your heart. We knelt down by that bed. She prayed the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard, this side of heaven. The prostitute opened her heart to God. And God forgave her that moment. Mm. Hey, listen to me. It don't take a lifetime. No. One moment. People come to me now, they say, wow, uh, I was saved in 1952. By the way, I was saved in 1952. I'm no more saved now than I was then. Mm. Even though I've given a whole lifetime to him. We think we're saved a little bit and we keep doing these good things, we're getting saved more. No, I was received by Christ then. I'm received by Christ this very moment. Yeah. She received Christ. That woman went to change her life. We baptized in the kingdom of God. She became a Bible worker, lay Bible worker, went around sharing faith, won hundreds of people to Christ. Mm -hmm. That was exciting. And, and I, was, I was at a lay conference recently, and I had just retired, and I'm feeling sorry for myself. I haven't really retired, but I officially retired. I don't get paid by them. So I'm officially retired. I'm walking through this big convention hall, I'm the keynote speaker, and I said, Lord, I've given you these many years. I said, I, I wonder if there are people that, you know, are they still with us and faithful? You know, you always wonder. Yeah. And people say to me, well, evangelists, all you do is know a number. No, I know every face. I knew them by their names. I was in their homes. The elders weren't. Mm. Church boards weren't. But I was. Yeah. I wept with them when they wept. I laughed with them when they laughed. I held their children in my arms, children that would be lost forever if it wasn't for the grace of God. So they're not a number to me or to any evangelist that I know. Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful. Well, there I was at this convention center. It's a, I'm there real early. I always like to get to my place early to look over the pulpit and get the feel. And I'm walking down this big car, to, and I say to the Lord, I say, Lord, here I am retiring, officially. I said, all my work, has it been for naught? I mean, other people, are they still with us? And I walk no more than five steps, and four women come running up to me and say, Ron Halverson. And they tell me, you baptized me, us, in this meeting. And, they, and they, they're lay leaders in their church. Mm. I, I, I'm overwhelmed. I mean, five steps. I make 20 steps beyond them, and a black fella comes up to me. He says, Ron Halverson. He says, remember, uh, no, remember uh, uh, Tabernacle? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. He said, I was a 24-year-old young 
guy living in a tenement across the street. He said, and I saw the sign, I came in, I listened to the word, I was baptized, I went to Oakwood College, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist minister today. Mm. And before I got to the hall, literally, a score of people had come to me and said, it's because of your meeting here or there that I know Christ. Pretty wow, fun. I was ready to preach that night. I mean, I was full of the Spirit. I was overflowing in the Spirit yeah. by the time I stood up to preach. There yeah. is a lady that I knew, great Bible worker. She served for me and also served for E.E. E. Cleveland, Jim, who lived 145th and Amsterdam, Wilma Curtis, for years and years. Right. I know she came into the church about that time. I don't know if she's in that meeting, but she, she was centered I, in Tabernacle. I wonder if that was the one. And it may be she lived right there, 145th and Amsterdam, uh, in the building, second floor, been to that apartment uh, uh, for years. And she's, she, she's dead now, of course. But yeah. well, she was a great lay Bible worker. Oh, yeah, this and, one uh, was, and I followed her for with a while. Cleveland and many people. And then after, yeah, I heard that she, she had passed away. Yeah, and could very well amazing. be the same person. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Well, listen, the Lord has really given you some wonderful experiences. And, and you're still holding meetings. The, the, I was at the one in San Bernardino, came one night, uh, saw you there. Hyveth Williams was there that night. Yes. Uh, she had the invocation. And your son, Ron Jr., was there. The Lord's blessed him with a very successful ministry. And your daughter. My daughter's a minister. That's right. right. And mm -hmm. so God has blessed uh, your family. Your wife, Carol, is in good health. She's still working with you and very vital part of the team. She keeps you organized. Yes. And, uh, but tell us some more about some of these. And agonizing. She keeps me agonized, too. Tell us some more about some of these meetings and some of these people. Well, I've, as, as you say, I've been uh, holding uh, meetings uh, ever since. Yes. I, I retired. Just before I retired, I, I wrote a book on prayer. Yeah. And so I moved in that direction, uh, mostly seminars on prayer. But I still hold evangelism to keep me in the soul winning, in, in the area of soul winning, in the right. area of touching people who are still, you know, reaching out to be saved. People yes. are still out there. I don't know, whatever they say about the culture, people are still out there, mm. empty, wanting to be filled by the mm -hmm. Spirit of God. And we're seeing uh, miraculous, we're seeing miraculous experiences. Um, uh, there at San Bernardino, uh, we had a wonderful we had a wonderful uh, experience there in the, in the Orange uh, Center there, mm -hmm. and uh, you were there. You saw what, what was, God yes. what God did for us. Before that, I went with uh, uh, Mark Finley. We yes. held a meeting in San Diego. We baptized 500 in that series right. of meetings. He'd preach one night. I'd preach one night. Yeah. He'd preach one night, and uh, the nights he preached, I would I would uh, tell uh, I'd answer the questions. Right. And the night. I preached, he would answer the questions, mm -hmm. and, and we had a wonderful time together. People, the ministers said, how can you and Ron Halverson hold a meeting together? You're so, opposite personalities. But that's what the greatness was about. Yeah. We, uh, people I'd appeal to, he wouldn't appeal to. People right. he'd appeal to, I wouldn't appeal to. You see, everyone has their gift to appeal to certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. right. So he would get up and preach, and, and me being loose as I am, you know, and relax. I, you know, I, I think that we should laugh. I yeah. think we should have fun. I right. think God has a sense of humor. Yeah, he I made agree. me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you. Yes. So uh, you, you sense that in my meetings, and it makes people feel comfortable. And, yeah. And um, uh, Mark, I don't know if you'll appreciate this story, but this was a good one. I think the people would appreciate it. it was night I went to, to uh, answer the questions, and Mark's getting ready. He's a very serious person. Oh, yeah. Mark Finley is a wonderful man of he God. He is. I, I respect and love him and his wife. They're dedicated. And he's a scientist uh, when it comes yeah, to soul. He, yeah, he's, he's, just, he's yes. just great. But he's very, you know, he's a little, yeah, yeah, you know, a little tight at Button times. Down. Yeah, a little. And, tense, and so yeah. I want to loosen him up a little. And <laughs> so I get a question. It's near the end of the meeting, and I get a question from some person. It says, is it all right to have sex on Sabbath? You know, you know, you don't answer this question on a public meeting. Yeah. I said, well, I said, since Mark is an authority on this subject, I'll let him answer this question. <laughs> and old Mark, his head dropped and he turned red and he, he, he about collapsed on that. And I finally said, no, I, 
I said, this is easy enough. I can answer this question. You know, I, I can see Mark just dropping his head on that. What, what, how'd you get out of that? What was the answer? Well, I didn't give him a theological answer. I just gave a simple answer. They got married on Friday. They didn't wait till Sunday. That brought the place down. That was it. And from then on, he was afraid to give me questions to answer. I think he looked at every question yeah. after that, to be sure. But Mark is so professional. He's so good at what he does. Yes, he is. And it was a real pleasure to work with him. And his dad was one of my elders in the church. And so the family's very close. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And yeah. And it was it was real. It was a lot of fun working in in uh, San Diego. Mm. All right. You, I'm sorry, Jim. No, you go ahead. You spent some time at, at Faith for Today. What was your your job as? I was the, the evangelist for Faith for Today, and mm -hmm. I'd go around the country and and uh, hold um, uh, a series of meetings. I held uh, six uh, major series a year, and in different places. And and I was there only a short time, about uh, three years, because I I was gone from my family too much and. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, I can't, I can't do this. And that's when I took the college church. I went there as youth pastor and was there youth pastor about two months, and then I was their senior pastor uh, at the college in uh, in Keene, Texas. And that's when I started to get into this prayer, uh, this prayer initiative, the idea of prayer being the fundamental basis for all evangelism. Mm -hmm. And it was there at, at Keene when I went to a, a prayer meeting. There was 30 people in a youth chapel, and here's a church of 1,200 members. And, and I saw 30. I went home. I cried all the night on my face in my office at home. And I said, God, you're not honored. You're dishonored here. And this mm. is the a, a center of Adventism in Texas, and you're dishonored. And I cried. And I said, God, I, I'm not going to allow this to happen. You, can't, you won't allow this to happen. So I got up on Sabbath. I've only been there two weeks as the senior pastor. And I said, uh, that uh, they were meeting in a youth chapel. Youth chapel sat 300 people, right? You've seen yeah. that youth chapel. Mm -hmm. And I said, now come early. I'm starting a series on, on uh, Moses, and, ten, uh, and I'm starting a series on Egypt to Canaan. I said, come early, because if you miss getting there late, you'll be standing out in the street. And if you looked at that chapel, they had three steps out into the street. <laughs> that first Wednesday night, when I, after I made that announcement, they were standing in the street. Believe yeah. me, wow. I'm not exaggerating. Jim probably been to yeah, some of them. True. So I said, the next Sabbath, you know, you're like Elijah. You have the, you have the devil on the run. So I get up and say, now we're going to have to move into the sanctuary. People's faces, they couldn't believe this. What? You, the, the, the youth chapel is not big enough? So I said, now come early. And I said, you're also, also you're going to have to sit in the balcony. Now the floor, the main floor sat almost 1,000 people. Yeah. That was before they put that nursery there. Right. Sat almost 1,000 people. And they were laughing, you know, who the old timers. And that <laughs> second... Wednesday night after the first big one there, they were up in the balcony. And from that moment on, they were in the balcony. And for four years, we had 12 to 1,500 people at prayer meeting. Incredible. Plus, we had a, a youth prayer meeting, kid prayer meeting, which we had uh, astronaut Bill, and we had almost 400 kids in the back room. Wow. So here we are. We had 12 to 1,500, and the church was revived by it. Mm. Uh, I could tell you miracle after miracle that came about through it. We, we, we got buses. I got one bus, and the brethren, the deacons were after me, and you know, bought a bus without, conf you know, without uh, board action. But I saw a bus that had seven, 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 on the license plate. How can I not buy no, that bus? No, you had to have it. Yeah. I mean, that was a symbol and a sign from heaven. Yeah. I bought this bus, and the bus was twelve hundred dollars or something, and to to license it was another four hundred. And I had the board meeting on Sunday. I had the bus parked out there on Sabbath, and the deacons were walking around kicking their tires, you know, and they were, oh, they were ready for me on board meeting. Hey, the best thing about a board meeting, if you want to get a lot of things done, put the hardest item at the end. Yeah, they sure. want to get to that. They'll vote, any, they'll vote you a new office. They'll send you to Hawaii just to get to that. They wanted to get to the bus. But that night before, someone called me up and said, I have, I have $1,600 I'd like to give to ministry. You have a special ministry. It took care of the licensing, the insurance, and the bus. Praise then God. before wow. you know it, a man, a man leased four buses to me for a dollar a year each bus. Yeah, we had, then we had six buses. Yeah. And we brought little children from all over the county, 1,200 non-Seventh-day Adventist children wow. and, and non-Christian children we brought to our... Out of that, we started branch Sabbath schools by starting story hours, vacation Bible schools. Mm. These vacation Bible schools are waste. You have it for a week in the summer, then you wait till next year to follow it up. Yeah. So we followed up with story hour. Alvarado, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, lake uh, over there. What's that lake? Um, Granbury. Granbury Lake. We mm -hmm. raised through through the bus ministry, and it was out of that that Praise prayer God. and the Holy Spirit just fell. Yeah. And from that moment on, I was convicted that if God, if revival is going to come to the church, it's going to come through the prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. We're doing away with prayer. I mean. You go and ask for the prayer. Where's the prayer room? They send you back behind the church and two little old ladies are praying. God bless the old ladies. But listen to me. When this church catches the vision, when this church sees what the power of prayer can do, mm -hmm. that we're in, a, we're in a battle and it's going to take warfare praying to take back this city for, these cities for God. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I started pastoral ministry. I love that yeah. there. I love the people there. Uh, I've had some there that didn't love me as much and had that <laughs> Texas accent, but the, but the majority did, and we, we did wonderful yeah. things. God did wonderful things for us. We are going to get to a book that you've written, which has become, Jim, I guess we could say a standard. Yeah. Uh, in, but before we do that, I wanted to just back you up just a little because you, you sort of uh, got your, your faith wings in some pretty tough venues. Uh, I'm thinking about Jersey City. Right. Newark, you know, we Newark. talk about back in the days of Newark, and Newark was burning. That was when uh, it was burning. The, 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 the uh, revolutionists were burning it down one way, and you were burning it down right. another way. So right. the city was really on fire. Places like uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, tough towns. Atlanta, and that downtown the brother Atlanta. Sent you too. Yeah. Uh, Miami, yeah. downtown Miami. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, think of those cities uh, that I've been downtown, uh, San Antonio. Mm. Um, that uh, that I held I held these series. So you were kind of a guerrilla fighter, kind of a marine. Yeah, for the I brethren. feel comfortable. You know, they, yeah. I, it's like it's <laughs> like uh, my wife's comfortable in the country. I can't take the country, but uh, she's very comfortable. I'm nervous in the country, but when I'm in the city, I feel at home because yeah. I'm, I know I read the city. I'll be walking down the street. I say to my wife, "Get on this side of me." She don't want to. Like, this guy coming along, I know what he's he's after. Yeah. She's on this side. I'm protecting her. Uh -huh. And sometimes I'm way ahead of her. She said, why are you way ahead of me for walking? I said, because if there's any trouble, I'm going to clear it for you, honey. Yeah. I said, not that I don't want to walk with you. I'm trying to clear the neighborhood. So, And I feel good with those people. I visit them in the tenements. And I visit. Mm -hmm. and, and yet I've had, I mean, I've baptized professors. In, in Loma Linda, we baptized doctors, lawyers. I mean, uh, homeless people. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it's level at the cross. Mm. Yeah. People of all walks of life, Jesus can touch with, his, with the gospel. The gospel is the most freeing thing in the universe. Now, this is a question. You know Louis Torres? Yes. What, did, was he baptized in one of the meetings that you held? Well, Louis, I baptized his mother in a crusade in Brooklyn. Okay, I baptized that's... his two married brothers in a crusade. All right. So uh, I baptized the family. It, it was interesting. They had a, this net with Mark Finley. I yeah. baptized his mother and his sisters. Right. Uh, Louis was the uh, coordinator. I baptized his mo his mother and his two brothers. Yeah. The Bible worker was a dan was uh, on Broadway as a dancer. I mean, not these pole dancers, right. but a really sophisticated dancer. And she came across on her breaks. She was converted. She was the Bible worker for that <laughs> meeting. So I said I had a lot to do with that net, right. even though I was in the background. Yes, yeah. so I had the privilege of baptizing, and I had the privilege also when she fell asleep in Christ to have her funeral for the mm -hmm. Torres family. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. family and uh, dedicated Christians. A absolutely. And uh, Brother Torres, a dedicated Christian man. Mm -hmm. And uh, him and I, you know, we don't always <laughs> see a like, but a like we see. Yeah, right. And uh, I really have great respect for them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, th there are so many people that, that you have touched their lives. Are there some others that you would like to tell us about that... I think when a, when a miracle was in, in Greenwich Village, uh, I was in Greenwich Village. They put me in a village. You know, I, the, the west side's the homosexuals, the, the, the east side of the, uh, the main her heroin addicts. That was yeah. back then, mm -hmm. during the, the, the one gums, the freebie gypsies, the, the, the hippie, yippie age, just beyond that. And so they sent me down to this little church in, in, in the west village. And my, we had to give out the handbills in those days. You couldn't send them out. We didn't have enough money. I called the church together to do that. No one showed up but the pastor, his wife, and his girl, my wife, my two children, and me. And we're handing out this, and it started to rain. I said to myself, I was feeling sorry. I said, Billy Graham doesn't do this. And the Lord answered me, well, you're not Billy Graham. And I said, thank you, Lord, for reminding me, and, uh, and, uh, which I have great respect for. Yes. And uh, someone came by and said, are you gay? I said, no, I'm happy. So he kept going. But anyway, <laughs> it's a great experience to have. And the opening night of the meeting, there were very few members there. It was a rainy night, and, but there were, there were a good group there, you know, for that place. It was a good group. In fact, in walked in a beautiful young couple, uh, Rick and Gwen Shorter, 
They weren't married then, but they're living together. He was a uh, music director for the off-Broadway play Hair, and uh, they were coming back from a, a, a party with Janis Joplin, and they mm. were high on coke, and you know, and, and they're stumbling along, and the Lord spoke to them and said, pick up that hand, and the handbill had fallen in the water. Someone threw it there, and it was soggy old handbill about my meetings. Rick leans over, picks it up. They're so stoned out of their brain. They get back to their apartment, put it on the heat register, go to bed, wake up in the next afternoon. And he looks at this thing. He says, what is this thing? And it said, you know, about my meetings. He said, well, we should probably go to that meeting. And uh, they showed up in that meeting and they found Christ in that meeting. But uh, the, the second thing that happened, in this little meeting in, in yeah. Greenwich Village, in walks four guys from South Bronx, Mott Haven. Hey, man, this is the center of juvenile. This is the center of gangs. Uh, in fact, the precinct, the police precinct has been attacked so much they call it Fort Apache, well, yeah. South Bronx. I, I went up the, I ministered on Fox Street. There are more mainline heroin addicts on Fox Street than any other street in the world. I don't know if you knew that, but that's a fact. Mm. That was, I ministered. But anyway, I'm standing up to preach it. In walks these four guys from the Social Sevens. They're flying their colors come down, sit in the front row. They're half stoned out of their brains. I'm preaching. I get done preaching, and everybody stands to sing the hymn, and they start out the center, uh, the center aisle. I don't want to lose them. Mm. So I run off the side, out into the alleyway. There's an alleyway between the church and the other building. I jump over to ash cans. I'm in my suit, you know, climbing over ash cans, and run out, and I just get out in front, and there's about six steps down from the church to the street, to the sidewalk. They're coming down high, man. They see me. They go, ooh, aren't you the preacher? I said, yeah. He said, no, you're in there. I said, no, I'm out here. He said, what are you doing out here? I said, you're out here. And mm. I wanted to tell you that God loves you, and I love you too. And I said, I want you to come back to these meetings. Hey, fellas, these meetings can save your life. Mm. I said, let's pray. Oh, yeah, man, ooh. And we kneeled down on, on was West 11th. Uh -huh. front of the church. I think it was West 11. Knelt down, prayed. New Yorkers stepping over us around us. You know how it is. You've been New Yorker, you know. And after the prayer, I hugged each one of them. And I saw them go out in the night. Man, my heart, I went home. I couldn't sleep. Wow. I prayed. I said, Jesus, don't let, them, don't let me lose them. Next night, they come out. Now, when a heroin addict stoned out of his brain. He could hardly, how, how did he even find a place? That was only the Holy Spirit. That was a miracle of God. Yeah, Came back God. the next night and the next night and the <clears throat> next night and the next night. I have an altar call, Rick and Gwen, these four from the Social Sevens. But before that altar call, I went out to visit them on Fox Street in a shooting gallery. You know that. That's where they take over an empty building. They're all the drug addicts. They're in half in, half out. Mm -hmm. I'm stepping over these guys, half in girls there. It's a mess. I get to them. They're sitting in the corner all by themselves, man. I said, they look and they're surprised. They say, you, you found me. You found us. I said, I found you. I said, God found you before I did, but I found you. <laughs> and so I, I sit down beside them and I tell them about what God did for my life. You see, our testimony is our greatest asset. Mm -hmm. Amen. And everybody who's ever been converted has a testimony. That's you right. don't have to be a gangbanger. Right. Hey, I mean, you could, you, you, you were, you had no peace. Now you have peace. You had no freedom. You have freedom. You, I mean, so I shared with them, and then I read to them the gospel. Where it says, "Call on the name of Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved." And right there, they called on the name of Jesus. Wow! I prayed with them, took their heroin, flushed it. Powerful. Three of those four are Seventh Day Adventist ministers today. Wow! Oh, incredible. In fact, one of them is he, he's a social work. He, he's a minister in the sense that he's a, a chaplain social worker in the prisons, mm. but two others. The other guy was so blown his brain, they had to put him in, in an institution, and they're in the institution. Mm. But, I mean, that was experience mm. that I had. I can't change that for, for anything in the world. What's yeah. sitting in a church with everybody, oh, how are you, happy Sabbath, you know, yeah, that's nice, but it's nothing like <laughs> seeing men and women changed by the gospel right. of God. Men that's and women, right. their lives transform. I, I was in Canada, Ottawa, Canada, preaching the word, man. I was in a high school auditorium. And, and it, it's hard there. And, and there weren't that many, maybe 300 people, total crowd. You don't get it on the back page of review. I don't get on the back page of review even about 3,000. But anyway, 
Uh, I just threw out that for the brethren. But anyway, I was, I was preaching 300 people in Ottawa, Canada. And this woman came with a friend. She was from the government. She told me the story later. She came, and you know how we do, we get their names, and I go visit them. That's sure. the excuse for evangelism. I get a name, I visit. I still do it. A 200 name visit, 200 visits a meeting, 150 visits a meeting. So I, I get the name, I go visit her, knock on the door, the, the door's open and a screen door. She comes, her name's Mrs. Amos. I say, hi, I'm Ron Howard. She says, I know you. She says, I was in your meeting. I said, yeah. She says, I'm an atheist. Just like that, she said, I'm an atheist. I said, oh, that's nice. I said, I'm a Christian. I said, boy, you got to come to these meetings. She said, what do you mean, I'm an atheist? I said, yeah, you'll know how to combat us Christians. If you come to the meeting, you'll learn more about Christianity, how to make you a better atheist. And I'd like you to come because I'd like to hear why you're an atheist, and that would make me a better Christian. She smiled, and she says, well, you know something? She said, I thought it was a political meeting. She said, it said, the Arab-Israeli conflict, how it will end. So she thought it was political. It was a <laughs> prophetic meeting. So she kept coming, this woman, Mrs. Amos. One night, she said, I said, well, can I, I'm going to come back visit you. She said, oh, yeah, now she's friendly to me. See, she's more friendly. She's understanding why we believe like we believe. Most people don't know why we Christians believe what we believe. Yes. They hear what we believe. Or they have some fanatical person that, that's so whacked off, you know, they're a cult, mm -hmm. and they make people believe that's what we believe. We don't believe that. So she says, oh, yeah, you could come. I came, visited her with her, and she said, you know, I have a son who's in military school, and he's having a tough time. I said, well, wh where's the address? I'll go visit him. She said, oh, no, he's 200 miles away. I said, that's nothing. Give me his address. I'll go visit him. She said, you'd go 200 miles to visit someone that you don't even... I said, that's a Christian would do that. And then she says, I don't know if an atheist would. I, I had her right <laughs> there. She, I had her right there. So she said, no, he's coming home this weekend. Would you talk to him? I talked to the boy. And I had a wonderful visit. Led her to Christ. She became a Christian. She was from Ireland. She went back to Ireland. Listen to this. Mm. She went to Ireland, became a coal porter, started selling books. Her father was a faithful Roman Catholic man, but he, he was losing faith because he was blind and he couldn't go to his cathedral. And so the priest would come by once in a while and knock at the door and come in and give him communion, sure, yeah. put the wafer on his tongue and then go, say, our father, and go. And he wanted someone to love him and to care about sure. him. And one day, the priest was in a busy, and so he said, stick out your tongue at the door. And he placed a wafer. He says, I've got to go. I'm in a hurry. And he came back crying, the old man. Mm -hmm. And the woman, Mrs. Amos, put her arm around and says, I never talked to you about how I became a Christian and this newfound faith of mine. She says, would you like to hear it, Daddy? He says, I, I need oh. something. Oh. She shared the gospel. He received Christ. Amen. She raised up churches in Catholic Ireland. She raised up a church school. I was at the general conference meeting in Dallas, Texas. I'm sitting in the audience, and they want to interview this spectacular woman who's doing so much for God in Ireland, and up steps Mrs. Amos, mm. who was once the atheist. <laughs> wow. And she was faithful to the Lord. And she helped me in a crusade in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I baptized a man there who became her husband. So I've had pretty good influence on some yeah. good evangelism, right? Yeah, that's good that's evangelism. Right. And, but it was amazing. I'm an atheist. Hey, yeah. it doesn't matter. God loves atheists. He loves us yeah. all. Yeah. And if we would just understand that, that he has such a, a, a future for us, mm. it, would, it would transform us. Yeah. Now, you've gone to places other than New York City and right. uh, like Tucson, Arizona. Uh, uh, you Phoenix, held a meeting I've been in Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix uh, Arizona, right. and, uh, and you held a meeting there. Yeah, I had a, a nice. We had a nice meeting in a, in a church in in Phoenix, Arizona. Baptized, I forget how many people. But, is, but is that was that the place you had trouble keeping your chair on the platform? Oh no, that was in Flagstaff, Arizona. Flagstaff, Arizona. Yeah, I was with <laughs> I was with Faith for Today, and and their evangelists. I travel all over the country, all over yeah. the world. In fact, right. I went to Trinidad, had a meeting. I followed E. E. Cleveland in Trinidad. This was funny. Wow. Because he had a meeting, they baptized 700 people in, in downtown uh, Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. So they're going to bring this white evangelist from New York to Trinidad, never heard of. And he's going to have a field school, about six students from Andrews University. So they brought me there, put me in a tent in a town that had never seen an Adventist church. They brought me two old retired Bible workers out of, out of retirement. 
huh. to hold this meeting. <laughs> so I knew what God was going to do. Someone said, well, you can't walk in the footsteps of E.E. E. Cleveland. I said, oh, no, I can't. I says, but, but I'm, try I'm not trying to walk in, in his footsteps. I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Right. Places packed out. At the end, we baptized 300 and some, and they built a, uh, a church there in, in Trinidad. Wow. But I was there, I was there in Trinidad, and uh, they, they had an open sewer around the tent. Every now and then, someone, they were so packed out, they'd be standing outside. They'd fall in, and I'd hear a splash. I'd say, did you count that one? Just kidding. <laughs> 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 we, just baptized, we just baptized another one. But yeah. there in Trinidad, we, we had yeah. meetings. We had meetings in, uh, in, uh, in, with Faith for Today. And yeah. so I was holding this meeting in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I built a platform. I'm not good at building anything, but we had to have a platform. It was in this open auditorium, and we had to set up chairs. And this young preacher, he was afraid of everybody and everything. And I kept telling him, holy boldness. I said, You're, you you got to be bold for Jesus. you gotta, you know, you got to be aggressive for Jesus. And, and he, he tried so hard. He was a wonderful man, wonderful, wonderful man. And his wife was a godly Christian. So the opening night, I said, you're going to have to make the announcements. She said, oh, I can't. I said, you've got to make the announcements. I can't make the announcements, sing the hymns, and preach. Right. So he says, all right. So here's this famous evangel, so-called, from, from Faith for Today, you know, world traveler. And this poor guy gets up, and he's stumbling through these announcements. And I'm sitting back on this <laughs> folding chair, relaxed, and I'm enjoying it. I can't wait to get up and preach. I can't wait to preach, even now. I can't wait to preach now. They invite me. I want to preach. Give me, the, give me the pulpit. That's what I, you know, that's what I've been born to do. So I'm sitting back, relaxing. And I lean back and I flip off the back of the platform <laughs> while this poor guy is making the announcements. And I get stuck between the wall and the platform and the chair folds and I'm like a turtle on my back. My feet are up in the air. <laughs> Opening night, here's this evangelist, famous person, supposedly. He's on his back, his feet are waving. And the poor guy turned and he froze. Oh, man. He froze in the spot. And I, I'm trying to get up and I can't get up and the people are laughing. I'm oh, laughing man. too. But this kid, no, he's serious. He's frozen. I finally said, get me up or you'll have to preach. And he brought that, that thought that, him out, <laughs> ran over, pulled me up. And so I said to the audience that night, I said, hey, you don't know what's going to happen with me here. You better come every night. And yeah. sure enough, they, they came did. every night. Praise God. God. Yeah. I mean, and now he teaches at the seminary. And every time I send my students from my field schools, I said, when you go to the Dr. Davidson's class, tell them holy boldness sent you. Yeah. And he'll say, Ron Howers. And yeah. sure enough, That's it's right. Ron Howers. And he's a great teacher. Oh, and so and is his wife. Godly man. Oh, yeah, yes. They're yeah. both great. They the, were wonderful. The book Prayer Warriors, we right. started talking about a little bit earlier. Tell us a little bit about this book and the impact it's having. The, uh, the longer I've been at this work, the more I understand we are at, we are at war. Ah, yes. I mean, we're in the midst yes. of the greatest battle. It's called the Great Controversy. Warfare. Very rarely do we hear, at least in Adventist circles, warfare praying. Right. We don't talk about it. Oh, it's more picnic praying. You know, prayer is the breath of the soul. Prayer is talking to God like a friend. That's all true. <laughs> but it's more than that. Prayer is a war. It's, I mean, the devil is, the war began in heaven. We mm -hmm. call it Armageddon. We have an eschatological understanding of Armageddon more than anyone else because mm -hmm. we believe it began in heaven. It's going on now, and the final stage will be in the end of time. Yes. You see? So this is going on, this battle. Everywhere in Scripture I was reading, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We box. We wrestle. We, we're in the army. We, we, weapons of our warfare. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The principalities and powers, the struggle, good and evil, that this struggle is going on in the human heart. And so I put my pen to paper and I wrote the book called Prayer Warriors. And in that book, I show the struggle, the warfare struggle. And I show that how the devil is taking territory. The devil is taking back. Just like gangs take turf, the devil takes ter ter territory. And I got into praying, and I got into this warfare praying, but then I, I read something. I got a book, a, a hold of a book in a used bookstore on prayer walking. And I went, wow, it wasn't new with me. They were doing this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But I, I read the book, and I said, wow. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to see if it works. I got a call from Hawaii. I was telling the Lord, I was complaining, Lord, you send me to all these hard places, the village, or Texas, you know, I mean, give me an exotic place. So lo and behold, a guy calls me from, from Hawaii, Martel, yeah. Lynn Martel. He oh, says, yeah. we'd like you to come and hold a big crusade in Honolulu, in Honolulu, Hawaii. Would you like to come? I said, let me pray about it. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those instant prayer. prayers, you know, instant answers. 
thank you, Jesus. And it answers the prayer. And I go, I'm going. I tell my wife to pack. We go to Honolulu. I said, I'm going to do this. My wife went to the International Mall to do shopping. She's from Venus. I'm from Mars. So I send a shop and I go walk. And I'm walking. I'm thinking of principles of prayer walking. And I see a prostitute on every corner. Hey, when you see a prostitute to the eyes of Jesus, you don't see a piece of merchandise. Mm. You see someone for whom Christ died. Yeah. And I started to weep on the, on the street. And I said, God, this is going to be my prayer territory. I'm going to pray this. And I'm going to ask you to give me one of the street walkers for the kingdom of God mm -hmm. while I'm here. Every Thursday, I sent my wife shopping. And I walked that street and praying, following the principles. There's three principles. You study the word. You preach. I mean, you pray. You quote scripture. You don't do it out loud. You're not making a scene of yourself, but you're mm -hmm. doing that in your heart. Mm -hmm. You're quoting scripture. You're learning scripture. You're praying. You're singing. So here I go, walking down the street. At the end of the crusade, a woman's baptized. 250 are baptized in that meeting. A woman's baptized. And she says to me, I got to talk to your pastor. And at the end of the, she says, I was a street walker when these meetings started. And I said, where? She told the very street I've been walking. Mm. From that moment on, I've been training people on how to walk the cities. I now do it for It Is Written. I do street walking, for, uh, teaching street walking for prayer and preparation for Sean Boomster's meetings. Mm. Wow. That, isn't that a tremendous story? Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been hearing a lot of tremendous things here. We're down to the last few minutes, or last minute, actually, of our meeting. But, um, Ron, God has blessed. As yes, we started out, we talked about this whole series is demonstrating when people give their life to Jesus, what he does in their life, how he takes them and how he uses them and how he reaches other people. And then those other people reach still others. That's right. And this is how that this great message has moved around the world. Yes. And CA, it has been a privilege to be here, hasn't it? It has, it has, um, to hear how God has blessed down through the years and uh, then to write this book, which is in, in its third or fourth or fifth or sixth printing, I'm yeah, sure right. it's, it's yeah. one of the most popular Six, things that has been printing. done. It's, it's yeah, right. Prayer Warriors, and I, I hope that maybe they'll say something about it. We and will. Pastors are using it for their prayer meetings. It's, it's been an exciting journey. Well, again, we, uh, we're honored that you would come and be with us, and we are praying that this testimony will reach the hearts of a lot of people. I believe it will. And you just keep on keeping on with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.